said, I'm Sasha Hinckley from the University of Exeter. I'm going to tell you about our uh, ERS program with JWST, and I'd particularly like to highlight the contributions uh, of my PhD student, Aaron Carter, who's a PhD student here uh, at, at Exeter, as well as my uh, two co-PIs, uh, Andy Skemmer at UC Santa Cruz uh, and Beth Biller. We also have 120 roughly additional collaborators that have made some contributions to the ERS program uh, over the last several years. So I think what I'd like to do is just start a little bit by going to my next slide. Are you able to see that okay? Yep. Okay, great. So this fundamentally is an early release science program related to exoplanets and specifically uh, the direct imaging of exoplanetary systems. So planets and maybe their circumstellar environments, circumstellar disks, things like that. And it uses the technique of direct imaging where we try to spatially resolve the uh, planet or circumstellar material from the host star itself. This has a whole host of advantages, like direct spectroscopy of any planets that are in the system, which leads to detailed characterization, all kinds of dynamical interactions between the planets and their disks. Uh, but as you can see, uh, maybe from the rightmost panel in my slide, this is technically very challenging. Uh, our task is to separate the very, very faint signal of a planet from the overwhelming glare of the host star. Uh, that you can see there. So these are really our limiting systematics in this uh, type of operation. Uh, every kind of science program with JWST probably has its limiting systematics. It's just that our limiting systematics are the host starlight, and they're typically uh, 10,000 or 100,000 or even a million times brighter than the planets that we're trying to, to image. So it's technically extremely challenging. Uh, but when, we, when we're able to overcome that barrier, we're able to uncover images of extrasolar planets like you see over here on the four images on the left. Um, so it's, it's, this is an incredibly fruitful uh, population of exoplanets to study. So moving right along, I've sort of highlighted a couple of what I think are key goals and challenges for exoplanet direct imaging. Uh, first off, we'd really like to uh, characterize planets over their full luminous range. We've really never done this. Uh, this is going to give access to chemistries, compositions, and maybe something about their formation. Um, at the same time, we'd really like to complete the survey for exo of exoplanetary systems at, at large separations where we really don't have any information uh, now. This is going to give us access to lower mass planets, fainter disks at the widest orbital separations. So what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes going through some of these uh, motivations, if you will. Let's start with the first one. Um, and there we go. Uh, the first goal that we might think about is characterizing extrasolar planets over their full luminous range. And this set of uh, images here are really a collection of what we've been able to do uh, from sort of three to five microns from the ground. Um, and I think that what you can see from a lot of these detections from ground-based observatories is that it's possible to directly image extrasolar planets from the ground, uh, but it's really challenging and we're really limited to modest sensitivity. So I think it's safe to say that wavelengths longward of about five microns are completely unexplored for extrasolar planets. There's some Spitzer and Akari observations of free floating brown dwarfs, but really it's fair to say that this is uh, uncharted territory, redward of about five microns. So JWST is obviously going to change all of that. So moving along in this sort of theme, um, everything we know in the direct imaging realm of planets primarily comes from sort of our observations at one to two microns. The dedicated uh, exoplanet imagers like Sphere and GPI operate uh, in this realm. And I like this plot uh, that I show at the bottom of the, of the slide from Andy Skemmer's uh, paper, where he has taken a set of theoretical models of the spectral energy distributions of planets uh, and overlaid them. And the, these models vary radically in their chemical composition, orders of magnitude differences in the carbon chemistry, and as you can see by the band average brightnesses, these horizontal lines, these are really indistinguishable from one to two microns. But as we go further to sort of three to five microns, these models tend to open up and really differentiate themselves. And this really allows us to dis sort of differentiate uh, the chemical compositions of these planets uh, where we really can't do that from one to two microns. So JWST is really going to transform our understanding of the physical characteristics of planets, masses, gravities, temperatures especially atmospheric composition. So I think it's safe to say that uh, our early release science program, as well as some of the GTO programs, are really going to be our first ever chance to directly observe extrasolar planets over their full luminous range. I think it's fair to say that. So 
Um, I'd like to keep moving a little bit with these themes and talk about how we're going to sort of, JWST is going to help us complete the survey of exoplanetary systems at the widest orbital separation. This is a plot showing uh, what our current understanding of the demographics of extrasolar planets uh, as best we know now. So on the vertical axis, we have uh, masses of the object, Earth masses on the left, Jupiter masses on the right, and at the bottom we have the orbital separation in AUs here, astronomical units. So the orange line, the orange points and the blue points correspond to the transiting planets and the radial velocity planets. And we see this uh, host of uh, planets sort of in dark blue, and those are some of the directly imaged objects that we've uncovered so far. But as you can see, the lower right of this plot is really unexplored, and this is where JWST is going to make a huge impact. JWST is really has the sensitivity, especially at wide orbital separations, that's really going to allow us to sort of uh, constrain the populations of exoplanets in this region of the diagram. So moving right along, um, I like this plot because this shows sort of how JWST is going to do that. Uh, this is, if you will, a sensitivity plot where now we're not plotting uh, mass on the vertical axis, but now we're actually plotting relative contrast. So that's contrast relative to the host star. So in the left here, we have 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7, typically where faint planets uh, exist. And this is the sort of relative contrast of planets relative to their host star. Now these sort of pink and red curves uh, show basically the sensitivity of JWST as we move outwards in the image. Close to the star, we don't have as much sensitivity. I think that's intuitive. And as we go further away from the star, we get deeper and deeper and deeper down. Um, and I'll just highlight these sort of blue benchmarks here that say 10 Jupiter mass, 1 Jupiter mass, 0.1 Jupiter mass. That's for a set of models assuming a stellar age of about 100 mega years. And what this tells us is that for young systems, uh, JWST is really going to be the only observatory period that will uncover new classes of directly imaged planets. We're talking about analogs of Saturn's and Neptune's at wide separation. So we've never seen an observatory able to do this before. Uh, these are modest predictions for what JWST can do. It may do even better than this. But if we're really going to complete these sort of demographics of exoplanets at wide separations, we really need the deepest understanding of the optimal strategies for observations, calibrations, and especially the data post-process. And that's really where this uh, ERS program comes in. So in t you might say, well, why don't we just do all this during the normal cycles? Why don't we uh, just wait till cycle one, cycle two uh, to do this? Well, I think there's a lot of lessons learned from uh, the work with Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the work that has been done with coronagraphs on the Hubble Space Telescope really took numerous cycles to perfect. And they're actually still being refined 20-something uh, years later. Um, so for JWST, the in-flight performance of the instruments has not been characterized at all, nor has the optimal strategy for obtaining data in flight. Um, and we really don't fully understand yet what the optimal post-processing steps are for the data. Um, and to do this, we really need the best understanding of the instrument responses, the stability of the point spread functions, and specifically the subtractions of the point spread functions from our, from our images. So given JWST's relatively short lifetime of five to 10 years or so, we really need to identify the correct observing strategy and the data post-processing methods as early as possible to really maximize the scientific potential of JWST. And that's really why uh, I tried to organize my community to, for an uh, early release science program uh, for this. So moving right along now, uh, our program here is called uh, High Contrast Imaging of Exoplanets and Exoplanetary Systems with JWST. Uh, my two co-PIs are Andy Skemmer at UC Santa Cruz and Beth Biller uh, at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I also want to highlight again this work of my PhD student, Aaron Carter, who's done an outstanding job with this. Uh, we have roughly 120 team members. About half of our team is from the United States, and the rest are from Europe, Canada, and Japan, uh, with a couple of uh, additional countries as well. Um, as I said, we have a large team. Uh, we have, uh, in addition to these uh, co-investigators that you can see on this list that are listed in gray, uh, we have a, a large number of what just are called science collaborators listed here in blue. Uh, and everybody has sort of helped to frame the discussion, if you will, uh, for our original proposal. So uh, 
So I'd like to shift gears a little bit here and tell you actually what we're going to do within our ERS program. A majority of our time is going to be spent doing coronography, that is blocking out the host star to image these faint planets in the vicinity of the star. A target we're going to spend a lot of time on is HIP 65426. This has a six to nine Jupiter mass planet that's in orbit around its host star. You can see the discovery image here at the sort of top leftmost that was made with the SPHERE instrument, the SPHERE GTO team. Uh, we're going to be observing this planet uh, all the way out to 15 microns or so, and we've got some simulations there at the top of the slide at 4 microns with NIRCAM and 15 microns uh, with MIRI. So um, I think it's safe to say again that when we combine the observations from the ground at 1 to 2 microns in the J, H, and K bands, this is really going to be the first data set to cover the full luminous wavelength range. This is going to be particularly powerful for uh, not only developing new models of these objects, but also saying something about their chemistries, their compositions, possibly even their formation. <clears throat> Moving right along now, we're also going to be doing a fair amount of spectroscopy. Uh, this is a target we're going to be going after. This is VHS 1256b. This is a, something like a planetary mass companion. Um, the advantage of this system is that it has a very wide separation from its host star, about eight arc seconds or so. And this really prevents uh, a lot of contamination of host starlight. Uh, and this is going to really allow us to get a very clean spectrum of a, of a, of a planetary mass companion. We're going to be using both the near-spec and MIRI uh, spec, uh, spectrographs to get spectroscopy all the way out to 28 microns. Uh, and this is particularly exciting because uh, we're hopefully going to detect the first, the first detection of clouds on a planetary mass companion. And this is going to be particularly powerful. We've never, ever seen spectroscopy like this of a planetary mass companion. We're also going to be testing out the aperture masking interferometry mode on JWST using, uh, <clears throat> using NIRIS. Uh, not so much to try to detect a planet, but more to understand the performance of the observatory. We're really interested in understanding the, uh, uh, really the residual phase errors within the, within the optical system. To really set the contrast floor. And this is really going to allow us to make clear recommendations uh, back to the community in advance of cycle two about how to use this mode uh, on JWST. Nonetheless, if we get lucky, maybe we'll detect a faint planet that's very, very close to its host star because this technique really thrives at finding things uh, at or near the diffraction limits uh, of the telescope. So as a breakdown of our time, it's sort of shown by this uh, chart here. Uh, a majority of our time is sort of shown by these this top row here, uh, whoopsie, excuse me, uh, a majority of our time, about 40 hours or so, is going to be dedicated just to uh, coronography of planets and disks on uh, uh, the object I mentioned as well as one circumstellar disk. Uh, but the spectroscopy we're going to do sort of shown in this middle row labeled planet spectroscopy is going to be relatively efficient, about six or seven hours. And then we're going to be spending uh, about seven hours on this uh, aperture masking interferometry mode that I just mentioned. So all in all, we have a 54-hour program, and about 32 hours of that are going to be directed to science. Um, so we worked hard with the instrument scientists, not only at Space Telescope, but all over the world, to make sure that we were sort of uh, organizing these observations in the most efficient way. And we feel that this is a fairly efficient uh, program, sort of a 60% science efficiency. So we're quite, quite excited about that. Um, we're also going to be, of course, uh, delivering a set of science-enabling products. Uh, I think the most uh, obvious science enabling products are just representative data sets themselves that we are going to, uh, that are obviously going to be widely available. Um, to, to decide on this, we, we really spent a couple of years synthesizing the intentions of our community to identify those common observing modes. But in terms of actual products we're going to deliver, um, the first thing is we're going to be delivering basic contrast metrics, that is the performance across, of the observatory across as many modes as possible for a of variety of, of post-processing methods. Um, we're going to deliver high contrast imaging analysis pipelines based on Python tools, um, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd like to just go through a couple of these quickly before I wrap up. So moving right along now to the next slide. This is a, a, a breakdown of our team. Uh, there's a lot in this slide, but I'll just work, uh, just guide you through it. We essentially, looking at the top of the slide, we have five working subgroups. Uh, so in green here, we have Coronography with NIRCAM and MIRI uh, on an exoplanet. In blue here, we have debris disk imaging with NIRCAM and MIRI. We've got spectroscopy in orange and aperture masking interferometry in yellow. Then we also have a theoretical effort here shown in gray uh, with some theoretical models of extrasolar planet 
atmospheres. Each of these working subgroups is going to be responsible for delivering a set of science-enabling products that I label here uh, in some detail, labeled SEP1, 2, et cetera. And I don't want to go through those in detail here, but just to say that each of these subgroups is going to deliver a science-enabling product. And then finally, we have a working subgroup uh, at the bottom. This is sort of a quality assurance team that's going to be led by Beth Biller, as well as Glenn Schneider at the University of Arizona. So I don't really think of this uh, so much as a, as, a, as a sort of an organization chart. I think of this more as a sort of a feedback loop where the uh, quality assurance team is going to be feeding back recommendations to the, the working subgroups to improve the science enabling products and sort of iterating in this way until we're happy with, with what we're ready to release uh, to the community. So just a quick a couple words in detail and then I'll wrap up. Uh, we're going to be delivering per clear performance metrics using a variety of post-processing methods, like I mentioned a few moments ago, basically telling the community uh, how well JWST is doing in terms of reaching this contrast compared to what we thought it would do. We're also going to be uh, delivering a Python-based high-contrast imaging post-processing pipeline. Uh, this is going to be used in conjunction with a library of JWST point spread functions, through starlight suppression. Um, Remy Sumer and others at Space Telescope have really demonstrated uh, the advantage of using a library of reference PSFs to improve the subtraction of the residual scattered starlight uh, revealing planets underneath there. And Remy and his team there were able to uncover images of extrasolar planets from 1998 that were hiding in the uh, Hubble Space Telescope archive. It's really an amazing bit of work, and we hope to do this uh, with JWST. So uh, if you want to find out more about our program, you can go to the uh, Early Release Science uh, webpage, which I show there on the left. If you click on Planets and <clears throat> Planet Formation, you'll get a list of all the approved programs, uh, and there's a dedicated webpage for our program uh, there. So I think I'll leave it at that. And um, are we taking questions, Margaret? Yes, we are taking questions. So uh, let's open this up. Thank you very much. That was very informative. I, I learned a lot. Um, anyone online that would like to ask a question, you can just simply unmute and ask. OK, I have a question. Um, I know that you probably um, spent a lot of time figuring out what the sources were. But I mean, there's probably so many good targets. How did you choose? a few targets that you could. Yeah, that was a huge bulk of our effort. So obviously, a lot of the sort of low-hanging fruit was taken by the uh, GTO team. Uh, but actually, we were very lucky in the sense that um, uh, once the GTO targets were finalized, uh, the SPHERE uh, GTO team, uh, the, the team doing the dedicated exoplanet survey using SPHERE VLT, actually uncovered uh, this object, HIP 65426, which is a bona fide extrasolar planet that they discovered through direct imaging. So fortunately for us, this was not on any of the JWST GTO reserve list. So we were able to basically uh, make it our, our prime target in our ERS program only a couple of months before the ERS proposals were due. I mean, this is a, it was a bit of a dream come true, really, because uh, this is really an ideal target to observe with J JWST. It's definitely an exoplanet. It's, nicely separated from its star so we're, we can deal with the residual scattered starlight very well. Um, and uh, uh, we got very lucky there, I'd say. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, choosing a circumstellar debris disk or a circumstellar disk to observe with JWC took quite a bit more work. Um, and actually, after the re launch reschedulings, we actually had to go back and, and modify some of our targets a little bit. And we're able to select uh, a really excellent a disk target that spans the field of view of NIRCAM much better. It's got multiple rings, so we're going to be able to test the performance uh, of NIRCAM at multiple radial separations uh, from the star. Um, so we, we feel like we have a very good target there. But, but really what we needed to do to, to identify these targets was really uh, synthesize the input from the community as best we could and ask the community, what are the, what are the modes you'd like to see exercised during these ERS programs? And um, what are the available targets that will let us do that? Wow. Okay, great. Well, that's that's a good inspiration for people who are going to be doing their putting their own programs together in the coming months. 